good evening and welcome. Tonight we will be going over the history and geography of Analamanga and Analajirofo in Madagascar. But a little side note that I have to throw in whenever I talk about Madagascar, and that's the Malagasy language is very complex compared to other languages. It's one of those that the romanization of it, the Latin version, is not pronounced at all as it would be spelled out for English, so I could be greatly mispronouncing these in Malagasy. I never found um, any actual audio uh, from someone who speaks Malagasy on how you're supposed to pronounce these places. So I'm going off the English language pronunciation. That's how you would say them in American English, but just know that that's most likely not at all how you'd say it in Madagascar. Just as a side note. Um, let's talk about Analogy Rofo first in terms of geography because as you can see it wraps around this section here which has this beautiful Indian Ocean coastline which has some good and bad things about it. The good is that there are lots of gorgeous little resorts all along here, which is one of the main industries of this section of Madagascar, is people coming to enjoy the beautiful ocean and the, the nice weather for the most part. I think, you know, Seychelles, even Maldives kind of styles of resorts and relaxation. It's very, very we even have this island here of, um, it has a couple of names. In American English, it would be pronounced Noshibraha. In Malagas, it's more Noshbra. And in French, it's Ile Sainte Marie. But, um, lots of interesting little sites for tourists here, although I also read do not go off the path, like stay in the tourist section. You don't know what could happen. Because everything in the interior is jungly bush, basically. And, uh, yeah, you, you're not going to be held responsible if anything, you know, happens to you if you go too far off the beaten path. But that's not the downside of this region. The downside is that this part of Madagascar gets hit almost yearly with typhoons, which is why there are so many straight lines over here. Even when we look at Nushbaraha, you're going to see that it has this big straight coastline that's from years and years and years of it just being pummeled by tropical storms. So... It has to deal with that, unfortunately, which only this side of Madagascar is affected by the rest, not so much. Not as regularly, at least. We're not going to talk about this region too much because um, I didn't find too much about at least recent history. There are some very interesting historical things that happened here, particularly on this big island, but we're going to talk about that in a minute. Let's talk about Analamanga over here, which as you can see is in central Madagascar in this upper plateau region. It is very hilly, quite mountainous, full of lots of little rivers and valleys and lots and lots and lots of little farming villages 
in particular, rice farming has always been the main crop to grow in Madagascar. You've got that tropical climate, lots of wet valleys, not to mention the Malagasy people are descended from peoples from Indonesia who brought their rice growing over here. This region is mostly important because the capital of Madagascar is located in it, Antanana Rivo, or Tana as the locals call it. We'll talk more about that right now, I guess. Let's talk about it. Let's get into history. So, like I was saying, the first peoples came not from Africa, even though Madagascar is very close to mainland Africa. They came from the other end of the Indian Ocean, pretty much from what is now Indonesia. And the first Malagasy people are known in Madagascar as the Vazimba. The Vazimba have a lot of truth to them, but they're are more legends and stories about them than actual fact. So they're almost kind of mythical, these first peoples here. They would have showed up much later than other places around the world, I want to say like the 900 CE, establishing their very distinct culture here, eventually trading with other people passing by me. Arab traders or people heading up to India. The Vizimba would have settled in this central area for a long time until they were defeated by the Imarina around the 1600s and the Marina became the dominant culture in the central plateau region here. Once the, uh, the Vazimba were all kicked out by the marina, they established the town here. It would later be called Antananarivo, which I think means like the thousand soldiers, in a throwback to the conquest of the region. Because there's one thing you need to know about the marina culture at this time, is that they were very militarily aggressive. They will fight you, and they will fight all your friends if it means that they can gain a foothold on a part of the island. So there are many, 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 many cultures all throughout. They built their royal palace complex, which they call a rova, on top of a big hill in Antananarivo. That hill is actually one of the twelve sacred hills of the Marina, which can be found all throughout the region here. Another hill is going to become important called Ambohimanga. Oh, I should say that before it was called Antananarivo, it was called Analamanga, which is how this region gets its name. They changed it to Antananarivo. But Ambohimanga is just a little bit to the north here. And that hill is important not because it's one of the twelve sacred hills, but in around 1710, the marina fell into a period of civil war, almost kind of their own warring states period, like in China and Japan. The region got divided into four quadrants, and the current king was kicked out of Antananarivo because that region split off. So he went north to Ambohimanga and reestablished his own capital. And wouldn't you know it, it is currently a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So let me pull that up. Madagascar only has three World Heritage Sites, so this is pretty cool. Slide this over. I'm kind of zoomed in real close, so we'll have to the Royal Hill of Ambohimanga. The Royal Hill of Ambohimanga consists of a royal city and burial site, and an ensemble of sacred places. 
It is associated with strong feelings of national identity and has maintained its spiritual and sacred character both in ritual practice and the popular imagination for the past 500 years. It remains a place of worship to which pilgrims come from Madagascar and elsewhere. Let's take a look at the pictures. There's some nice ones here. You can see the big hill and lots of cool palace ruins. Not to mention places that people still live today around this area. Not obviously in the old royal complexes, but in and around it. It's a living site. Which is really cool. So yes, it was an old castle. And was for about 80 years or so the capital, like the official capital, where the, um, the winning Marina King would rule. Let me slide this back over. They would recapture Antananarivo in 1793 and eventually reunite the region before they went out conquering other parts of Madagascar and bringing it under the Marina Empire. I would say it was an empire. But let's hop over to the coast for a second and talk about what was happening here. Because this region was sort of an amalgamation of different cultures. There was not one dominant culture like how we've talked about in other parts of Madagascar, even here. It was kind of a mix. It was kind of the wild country, which if you've seen the rainforests of Madagascar, you know why, because they are very thick and wild. Not much urban planning you can do there. So this region, particularly this island of Nushbaraha, came under the control of pirates. Indian Ocean pirating is kind of underrated gets a bit overshadowed by the Caribbean pirates or even the Barbary Coast pirates, but there was a huge, huge pirating industry in the Indian Ocean because we have not just the Arab lands, we have the Indian subcontinent and the Spice Islands. All of these very different areas with very different things to trade that were very, very valuable coming and going across the Indian Ocean. So many pirates took advantage of that. And the number one main pirate base was Noshpra in what's not Madagascar. Now, obviously, many governments, particularly Britain, weren't very happy about the pirates here. And they did a lot to try to quell them. There's some interesting stories about uh, Britain sending sailors down here to try to stop them. And once they got down here, they realized there was a good thing happening and they would wind up ditching Britain and becoming pirates themselves. Raiding the seas and becoming filthy rich. Like, very rich. The people living here didn't really mind because um, they were reaping the benefits as well. Pirates were treating them pretty well. There weren't a lot of conflicts in between. There were conflicts, but it was never extreme, you know, for the most part. They got along. And in some cases, they got along very well because some pirates married the indigenous women here, in particular many princesses many tribal leaders' daughters were married off to pirates. One person in particular was born of such a union. His name was Ratsimilaho. There's a lot of stories about him. He was obviously born in Madagascar. Um, allegedly, he went to Britain for his education. Um, it gets kind of murky there, but nonetheless, he was needed back home came back because his mother was a princess, he was technically royalty, and he wound up uniting all the tribes in the region and becoming their king. King Ratsmilahu was the first king of the Betsimi Saraka. 
which is now the dominant ethnic group in this region. Like nowadays, it has one main ethnic group, the Pensimi Sirak. That would have been around 1710. So while all the chaos was happening over here politically, this area was thriving in terms of not just piracy, but culture as well, developing their own separate identity to the point where the Petsimi Sirocco were like the number two most powerful ethnic group in Madagascar. Marina couldn't have that, and they would fight once this was reorganized in the early 1800s, and the Marina would conquer the region in 1817. The Marina would wind up conquering pretty much the entire island. I think they missed some areas in the south, but um, they they got all of like their important zones came under marina control. So when the British started to come over to Madagascar for missionary work and trade and all of that, they recognized the marina king as the king of Madagascar. It remained that way for a long, long time. The 1800s, the British started to help build up in Tananarivo in terms of um, schools and, um, you know, little important centers for them. Um, they built Lake Anoche, or Anosi as we'd say in English, uh, a little lake in the center of town. Um, I'll show you on Google Earth, they try to make it heart-shaped. They kind of failed. Do you remember when we all played Animal Crossing and we made heart-shaped little ponds? <laughs> Very similar to that. Like, they look like hearts, I suppose. Um, very similar to that. They also introduced brick-making to the island, um, which is important because most buildings in Madagascar are brick-style, or made of bricks, I should say. They're in more of a French style. And, um, you'll find out why in a minute. First, we have to talk about, um, what happened here during the queen, the, the reign of Queen Rana Valona the first, because there was a big British influence here, and she kicked them all out. She wanted no outside influence, and she definitely did not want Christianity on her island. So the British, you know, they were missionaries, helping out people, converting people, building churches. She undid all of that. And if anyone here still identified as a Christian, um, they would not be able to for much longer because they would no longer be in their bodies. She got rid of many, many, many Christians. Um, either you had to leave the island, or you had to leave your body, and many chose to leave their bodies. So, once her reign was done, her son came into power and undid all of her policies, opened the country back up, allowed people to be whatever religion they wanted to be. So, most of the churches in Antananarivo are martyr churches, remembering those who died for their faith under Queen Rana Valona I. She did, like, a lot um, of atrocities, let's say, during this time. That's just one of them. She also apparently had a little house in the middle of Lake Enoshi, which is... I kind of like that, to be honest. Today it's a church, or it's a monument, I think. But the... Solo reign of Madagascar, the main Malagasy reign of Madagascar, would not last for much longer because in 1894 the French invaded. Um, they would conquer the, the capital in 1894, they would conquer Analanjirofo in 1896. Again, it's thick and penetrable rainforest, very hard to make sure you control the entire region, right? And it became a colony of France, which is why many buildings are in French. Um, you want to say, like, French colonial style, but it's kind of French colonizer style. Like, you only really see that style of architecture nowadays in former French colonies. Like, you see that style kind of in, like, Vietnam as well. 
kind of with like the the columns in the front. It's sort of a New Orleans style, but very distinct because it's all made of brick. And that would last well into the 1960s when Madagascar became independent. Madagascar's had its ups and downs in terms of politics. They had a, um, a moment where they were socialist, like extreme socialist, like buddies with the Soviets. Um, that was under, um, Ratsimi Sirak, is that his name? Ratsimi, I forget his name. Um, I think he's the current president, prime minister, leader of Madagascar. He got re-elected saying like, my bad, I won't do that again. But it's interesting because every leader besides him has been of Marina descent and he's of Betsimi Soraka descent. So I guess that Betsimi Soraka would eventually get their day, right? Um, really the only thing that is significant in Antananarivo are the various floods that have happened here in recent history. The most recent one was 20. Because even though they're up in the highlands, the elevation is very, very varied. There are lots of high points and lots of low points, so those low points are getting more and more flooded every rainy season. Over here, though, like I said, the main industry is tourism, but there is also lots of interesting little farms and plantations of very distinct Madagascar things like cloves is really big over here. The vanilla industry is big here. Madagascar produces the most vanilla out of any country in the world. Um, they also grow a lot of ylang ylang here, which is really neat. So, with that being said, let me pull up my tablet. I don't have very many places to show you, but I'm obviously going to show you Antananarivo. You can see what it looks like there. Let's slide this over here. First, I'm going to zoom out so you can see exactly where we are in the world if you don't know where Madagascar is. So here you can see is mainland Africa, which is why I said, you know, you would think that uh, the Malagasy would be descended from peoples from Africa, but they are descended from peoples over here sailed across the ocean, or maybe even traveled by land and hopped over, but um, DNA and the cultures uh, testify to an East Asian culture. And you can really see the difference of landscapes from above. You can see the forest region here, the upper highland plateau region, and you can see this very straight coastline here. So let's look at Narivo real quick. Um, I tried combing this region to find you some other cool things, um, but there's not a lot of really good pictures to show you, and you can see from above that it is very rocky, hilly, with lots of little pretty green valleys, perfect for rice farming. But let's check out the capital city. If you can hear my cat crying at the door, just ignore him. Oops, that's not the capital city. That's just a random marker. I'm gonna zoom out, zoom out, zoom out. There it is. There's Tana Narivo. So the most distinct thing you can see is this upper marshy area, and this is because this is the suburbs, the city. The city's right here. So this is all very, very lush rice farms and reservoirs for the rice paddies. So there, there's lots of little city centers in here, and I tried to comb through this area too to find you guys some cool stuff, but there's really not a lot, but it's so, like, distinct from above. Like, you can point it out immediately, all these little watery bits up here, but the main city is down here. As you can see, this is the Royal Hill here. Let me zoom in closer and put it in 3D so you can really see the difference in elevation here. 
big hill. So obviously you have this huge hill up here. You're gonna build your royal centers up there. So the ones that are like museums today, the Queen's Palace. Let me slide this over. Actually, it'll look like this. You can see the the ancient part of it. A little church there in the complex. And it kind of looks like a little, this almost looks like a little Thai shrine, doesn't it? The view from up high down to the city below. It's a really pretty area. I like the columns. Oh, what a lovely statue. But nearby is the, my goodness, where is it? There we go. Stop. There. This palace, which I believe is, okay, Prime Minister, it said. The current Prime Minister's residence, where you can see this very old column style that I was talking about, and these bright colors, very French colonizer style. Cool building. So, I think you can tour parts of this, but obviously if it's the Prime Minister's residence, uh, you cannot. There's some old art of the Fazimba there, because this, remember, was the original Fazimba uh, royal complex. And lots of neat architectural sites, architectural, archaeological sites around here as well. Old cannon. So that, I think, is a neat little spot. Here is Lake Anosh over here. Anosi. You can kind of see the heart shape here. And there's the little central area. Can't really see from above though, but it's a war memorial nowadays. Um, but yeah, there's little other spots you can look at the zoo and the various little museums, but um, nothing too exciting for me to show you in this video, but I do highly encourage you to explore it all on your own because there are lots of other little things that are pretty cool that you can check out. But we're going to hop over to the coast. Now over here, I thought, oh, there'll be all kinds of cool things to show you over here. Alas, there really is not. All these little coastal towns here don't really have very many slideshows to show you. But it is very lush and beautiful. Even the the national parks and reserves in this region don't have very good slideshows. You can see the dark green there. Madagascar had a huge problem with deforestation in the 20th century, which is why this area looks like this and is not beautiful lush jungle. So Madagascar nowadays takes their reserves very seriously. So. Uh, there's lots of little reserves around here, national parks, but the slideshows are kind of lacking. I think that's because they're very deep and impenetrable. Not a lot of photographers going in there. And a lot of nature reserves in Madagascar, you cannot enter for pleasure. You have to be a scientist or a government worker of some kind to go into them. So, not a lot of photos, but... I do want to show you, here's Nosh Praha. I'm going to show you the coolest thing, which is not advertised uh, anywhere, but um, you kind of have to sneak your way to it. It's not even on Google Earth, but someone has taken a photograph there. So we're going to check it out. Let's go in. This is the world's only surviving pirate graveyard. All of these tombstones here, there's hundreds of them, this picture only shows a couple of them, are tombstones of pirates. None of them can be read anymore. There's one really cool one where you can still see a skull and crossbones. But this is so cool, isn't it? They really should advertise little tours here. You kind of have to figure it out on your own to get here. Um, 
they're saying that this big one is a pirate king, but we don't know for sure because it's all worn down from the various storms that have hit this area. A lot of them are toppled. But yeah, the world's only known pirate graveyard. Isn't that amazing? That is the coolest thing in my opinion. You can see the red soil they call Madagascar the Red Island because of this bright red soil. You can see it going out into the sea here. It's all over the island, not just this island. But yeah, lots of little towns that you can explore. It's just they don't really have many slideshows. So if you want to explore and if you find any that I missed, let me know because I want to see cool places here. Pretty much everything is along the coast because they say, you know, don't don't venture off the path and you can see oh no i did find one more place i'll do the outro you can see all the coral here there are lots of cool little sand dune islands here which um are scuba diving spots and um very important conservation sites because many turtles come here to lay their eggs so there's certain times of year you cannot go on these little sandbars and some of them are only around during low tides, too, which is really neat. But I'm going to end the video here for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this style of content, please consider subscribing. This is an ongoing series on my channel. Next, we're going to head over to mainland Africa and explore a region of Nigeria which also has a very rich indigenous cultural history that's still alive and well today. So be sure to subscribe so you won't miss out. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a good, good day.